Hey guys, welcome to this video. We're going to look at this Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals case from 2016. And this involves an appeal from the U.S. Tax Court. And so we'll talk a little bit about an offer and compromise. And I think you'll also find it interesting just to see some general principles of appeals and what happens if we don't raise something or we wait till our reply brief. So typically the one appealing files the first brief then the other side responds, and then the one filing the appeal gets a reply brief. Well, what happens if you raise issues in the reply brief for the first time? And so we'll look at that. So here's the deal. We've got this uh, guy who's an investment consultant, and he did not file his returns from 92 to 96. Eventually he filed some, but the IRS said, Look, you owe us $13 million. Imagine that. And it's really important because, and this comes up most of the time in tax cases, he does not contest any portion of that liability. So he doesn't say, well, IRS, you say it's $13 million, but really it's $1 million. No, he says, I agree, it's $13 million. So what happens next? Well, in 2007, the IRS says, look, we're going to use some levies here to seize your money or your assets. And when you get that, you have to be told that you have a right to what's often called a CDP hearing. So that's the collection due process hearing before the IRS Office of Appeals. And that lets you uh, argue, hey, you shouldn't be allowed to levy uh, my assets or my money. And the main argument was, hey, I want to do an offer and compromise. We talked about that a couple days ago. Offer and compromise is typically where you're saying, I don't dispute that I owe the money, but there's some real serious questions whether IRS, you'll ever be able to collect it, so you should take a settlement amount. So that's what he's saying here is don't do a levy. Instead, take a settlement that's offer and compromise. And after the hearing, the Office of Appeals said, nope, we agree, the levy should go forward. So then he goes to tax court to challenge that, which is his right to do. And the IRS moves for summary judgment, and that's the same as it is in any other case, whether we're suing a trucking company or a mortgage company, or whoever it is, summary judgment is where one party says, there's no reason to have a trial. I'll give every benefit of the doubt, factually speaking, to the to my opponent, but I still win. No reasonable juror or judge could rule against me. So the IRS moves for summary judgment. Tax court denied it. And then the party said, you know what? We're going to let you submit an offer and compromise. So the tax court said, well, I'll continue this case to give you time to try to work it out. So he submits an offer. Now this is in 2010. And what he owed at that point was $15.5 million. He said, hey, I'll pay half a million bucks within four months. So if you remember from our offer and compromise video, basically an offer and compromise, either you do a lump sum, which means that you'll pay it within five months, or you do a payment plan, which is different than an installment agreement. But a payment plan for an offer of compromise is 24 months. So here he's doing, in essence, a lump sum. I'll pay half a million bucks in four months. And so, as you might imagine, you have to give all sorts of financial information about your assets, your income, your expenses. And so he said, the companies that I control or that I own were $3 million, uh, expenses 10000 a month, income 15000 a month. Now, the IRS rejects his offer, and they reject it for a couple of reasons. One, they say you have an egregious history of past noncompliance. In other words, you're not filing your tax returns. You're not paying your taxes. Uh, and so we're basically going to view you in a negative fashion. Now, later on, we'll see that the taxpayer says, well, wait a minute. You can't just say... I'm going to reject your offer and compromise because you didn't pay your taxes because by definition, everybody doing an offer and compromise has not paid their taxes. And the court says, well, that's not what they're really talking about. They're not just saying that you got behind, but that you have been very difficult about this. So then they point out that 
Uh, he's had these, presumably his own companies, pay a lot of his personal expenses. And while he said my companies are only worth three million, sometime prior, I don't know how long ago, but when he was doing a loan application, he said those companies are worth twelve million. So there's a, a concept in the law, typically called estoppel that you're not allowed to say one thing over here and then something different over there. So if you tell the bankruptcy court you do not have a lawsuit, but then after you get discharged from all your debt, then you go file a lawsuit, the court says, well, wait a minute, we at least have to look at that because you were telling people two different courts, two different things. So same thing here. If you say to the banks, hey, my companies were worth $12 million, but then to the government you say $3 million, they're allowed to at least be skeptical of you. And so the IRS said, look, we don't think that's in the best interest of the government. So he appeals it. And so he appeals a rejection to the IRS Office of Appeals. And then uh, they go through some process there. And let me just highlight this. They said he failed to report all of his income, failed to fully disclose his financial situation during that C CDP. So that's your collection due process type hearing and failed to prioritize payment of taxes. And so they said, we think you're what some people abbreviate the RCP reasonable collection potential to be 12 million, not half a million, but 12 million. And so after that, the tax court, because remember they had uh, just kind of put a freeze on the case or continuance on the case. Well, now they put his petitions or his cases back on the docket get ready for trial, and the court ends up upholding the Office of Appeals decision to reject his $500,000 offer and compromise. So what does he do? First, he attacks the tax court as lacking jurisdiction. So remember, jurisdiction, whatever court we're talking about, jurisdiction is power either over the person, so we call that personal jurisdiction, or power over the subject matter. In other words, what is the case about? And that's called subject matter jurisdiction. So he first attacks the jurisdiction of the court. And basically, his argument is, I'll just highlight it here. When they were trying to reach that compromise, he says, you should have sent the case back from the tax court to the Office of Appeals instead of continuing the case. And since that never happened, the tax court never had jurisdiction to consider the supplemental notices of determination. In other words, the ultimate decision by the Office of Appeals to reject his offer and compromise. And the court goes, nah, we're not buying that. And uh, basically, uh, let me just, this gets a little tedious, but uh, this is important to know. So when you're in that CDP proceeding, you can make an offer of collection alternatives. That would be something like an installment agreement or an offer and compromise. And then within 30 days of that determination by the Office of Appeals, you can petition the tax court. And so they say there's two prerequisites, two requirements for the tax court to get power over this case. First, Office of Appeals must issue a notice of determination following a CDP hearing. And then second, you must file a petition challenging that determination within 30 days. And the taxpayer, this is important, does not contest both of these were satisfied. Instead, what he says is, well, tax court had jurisdiction over those original notices of determination, but not the supplemental ones. In other words, after he did the, the uh, $500,000 offer and compromise. And they say, but you don't give us any authority for that. And basically they go, look, you know, we're not going to get overly technical here. You know, the court could have remanded it. The court kept it. It's no big deal. You had all the due process you're entitled to. So they reject that. And, and so I wanted you to see that just to know that there's always the potential when you're in federal court to attack the jurisdiction of the court. And, you know, the court, when that comes up, or even if the court raises it on its own, the court has to look at that. But this was maybe a little too clever. I mean, you you petitioned it as a taxpayer. You went to tax court, and then you said, wait, don't go to trial. 
give me an offer and compromise. Let the IRS consider that. They looked at it. They rejected it. And then you had your day in court and tax court. Now you're saying, well, the tax court never should have considered it. Judges are saying, no, we're not buying that. But here's the part that's going to be more interesting, which is, did the IRS do something wrong when they rejected his offer and compromise? So remember, he does not dispute his tax liability. And so the tax court, they look at what the IRS did on rejecting an offer and compromise and say, was that an abuse of discretion? Which that's just a standard of how an appellate court looks at something. It basically means the court is not going to simply say, well, would I have done it different? Would I have made the same decision? They go, I might disagree with what the lower court did or here the lower agency, the IRS, but was it really wrong what they did? And then the appellate court here reviews the tax court's decisions de novo, which means they don't give any deference to the tax court. They say, we're going to look at this on our own. And so you kind of combine those two and we'll see how that plays out. So when a taxpayer challenges a proposed levy, remember the IRS said, we're going to issue these levies. The IRS must consider whether any proposed collection action balances the need for efficient collection taxes with the legitimate concern of the person that the collection be no more intrusive than necessary. So that's our statute. It says the IRS has to look at this. And remember, the numbers are $15.5 million in unpaid taxes. And he said, I want to pay half a million within four months. So what's the, the test here? Well, this is what they're quoting. So when you look at the taxpayer's proposed alternative, you follow the procedures, give a reasoned decision, don't rely on improper criteria or facts that are contrary to the evidence, we won't reverse simply because we would have made a different decision. That's what abuse of discretion means. So if you're a sports fan, uh, this might be similar to an instant replay where we say, okay, the guy on the field made the call. You know, it was a touchdown or whatever. Now, if we're going to review that, it's not just does the guy in the review booth, would he have made the call differently? It's like, is there, you know, sort of overwhelming evidence? So that's a similar thing. It's not exactly the same, but it's similar. And so here we have tax court, their conclusion did not abuse discretion uh, based on his well-supported findings that he had not complied with his income tax obligation, not fully disclosed his financial circumstances, and not prioritized payment of his tax liability. In other words, if you go spend a bunch of money on everything else and then say, now I'm broke, that can be a problem. Now, there is legitimate planning that we can do, staying within the rules and the guidelines of the IRS that can influence in a positive way getting an offer and compromise accepted. But this guy went a little bit uh, beyond <laughs> what he should have. So here are his arguments. He says, you could not reject my offer uh, on the basis I've not complied with tax obligations because every offer is made by a delinquent taxpayer. And we've talked about that. And that's true. Okay, so here's another way of saying it. If the purpose of offers and compromise allow delinquent taxpayers to sell their liabilities, and taxpayers' delinquency alone cannot provide a basis to reject his offer. And that's a very, very good argument. But here, the court says the Office of Appeals did not reject it just because he failed to pay income tax. It said, look at this, he continued to violate tax obligation by continuing to fail to report all of his income in later years and by failing to pay his liability when he had the means to do so. So that's a different story, okay? So picture this on a timeline. You know, over on the left-hand side, you've got, you, you didn't pay your taxes. And then you come to a point, maybe in the middle of the timeline, where now you're making an offer and compromise. Well, if you're doing everything right now, they're not going to, reject you for an offer and compromise just because you were late because everybody was late or you wouldn't be doing an offer and compromise. But if leading up to the offer and compromise, you're still violating the law, you're still not paying taxes, that's going to kind of really sour the IRS on saying, yeah, we'll take less. Again, go back to football. You score a touchdown 
and then I come to you and say, now look, I, I know that you, you get six points and you can kick a extra point or go for a two point conversion, but how about um how about you just put three points on the scoreboard? You're like, well, why would I do that? Well, I've got to have some pretty convincing arguments to convince you, my adversary, to do that. Now, with the IRS, when you're in the Office of Appeals, it's not supposed to be that you're in an adversarial relationship with them, but they're supposed to look at this and balance. Are you being fair to the government? Or are you being unfair? Is the government being fair to you or unfair? And so this is a problem when you're continuing to do things the wrong way. And so non-compliance with his obligation provides an adequate basis to reject his offer and compromise. And then he says, the calculation is wrong uh, because all the relevant assets have been liquidated at value substantially less than assigned by the IRS. So I take it from that that he's saying those companies that you guys said were worth you know many, many millions more than the three million I said, I actually sold them for less than what you said. But here's a problem. This is a really important principle in any type of law. He does not point to any evidence in the record. So where's the proof of that? Now, he says it, but where's the proof of it? If there's no proof, then the appellate court's not going to look at it. And without any proof, he fails to show the values used by the Office of Appeals are contrary to the evidence. You get out of the evidence to show it's contrary to it. And then they say, in any event, even if some of his assets were overvalued, he does not contend his actual collection potential was only 500000 So remember, they put his uh, reasonable collection potential at, what was it, $13 million? And he says five hundred. Well, he's not even arguing, according to the court here, that his true collection potential is only five hundred. So they're saying, you gave us a bogus number. And so you can't show the Office of Appeals abused its discretion when it rejected its offer. And so here's a couple of footnotes here. He argues in his reply brief, the IRS relied on other improper factors. And they say, look, and this is true of almost every court, we're not going to really consider something that you don't raise in your opening brief. Think about it this way. So if I'm the taxpayer, I appeal to the Eighth Circuit. And I make my arguments. Well, I get to choose out of 10 arguments whether I am going to make all 10 or 9 of them or only one of them. Well, then the the other side responds. Well, they shouldn't have to respond to arguments that have not been made. That would be unfair. They respond to the arguments that are made. But then in my reply brief, I spring this up. And we see this all the time with defendants. They'll file a motion for summary judgment, a motion to dismiss. We respond, and then their reply brief, they raise totally new arguments. We go, wait a minute. We didn't have a chance to respond to that. And so most courts do what this court is saying here, that you know we generally do not consider arguments failed to raise in its opening brief. Thus, they say, we grant the IRS's motion to strike. So that's what you do when somebody raises something improperly. You say, judge, strike that. In other words, Get rid of that. Don't consider it. The IRS motion to strike portion of reply brief arguing the IRS considered other improper factors. And then we have here kind of a final thing. We declined to address his remaining arguments, which he forfeited when he failed to raise them in tax court. So if you sort of visualize this way, you're in the IRS and you can't work it out. And so you you go to this office of appeals and then you say, I don't like what they did. So you get a tax court. And you don't raise issues in tax court. And then you go, I don't like the way the tax court decided. So I'm going to go to the higher court. And then you say, reverse that tax court for arguments I never made to the tax judge. Well, that's just not fair. So again, when we don't make arguments, we waive them. Now, it's a matter of strategy. And it takes some courage and some guts to not raise every issue. problem with raising every issue is... Sometimes you raise so many and you have page limits and all this sort of stuff that it means you're just barely touching on any of them. And sometimes it's better to find that one or two or three arguments that are really solid, like a laser shot, and and you fire that. And But you got to have the guts to give up some other arguments. So again, it's a matter of strategy. And apparently, according to the court, he didn't raise these 
in front of the tax court, so they're not going to consider it. And then he didn't raise stuff in front of the appellate court in his initial brief and then tried to raise them later. They go, we're not going to accept that. So again, a principle is uh, the, the higher court is almost never going to reverse the lower court, Okay, whether that's uh, small claims, whether that's uh, district court, uh, and with small claims, actually, in Alabama, I guess I should clarify that. When you appeal, you start all over, okay? So it's not really reversing them. But my point is, it doesn't matter what kind of judge you're talking about. A higher judge is typically not going to be critical of a lower judge for not doing something that you failed to raise to them. So if I'm in trial and I don't make an objection to, let's say, hearsay, and then I lose and I appeal it and I go, you should reverse that whole week-long jury trial, even though I didn't raise the issue of hearsay with the judge. They go, well, we're not going to hold the judge responsible for an error when you didn't point it out to the court. So uh, hopefully all that makes sense. And uh, this is you know, a little different than other cases we look at, but as I mentioned in a previous video, the IRS is sort of the ultimate debt collection agency, right? I mean, they've got all these powers. And, you know, we might owe $20,000 on credit card, but when we are really dealing with IRS problems, we're talking like 100000 200000 Maybe we had a small business and we didn't do the payroll taxes. And, I mean, the, these taxes can just be devastating. And so... I thought, well, let me go ahead and share some of this because we help people with this, but I really haven't talked about it much. And so I hope that you find this helpful. And as always, if you have any suggestions or questions, just reach out to me directly, 205-879-2447. And my name is John Watts or alabamaconsumer.com or just put it in the comments below. And I'll catch you guys tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.